The Lake District, also known as Lakeland, is one of the United Kingdom's most picturesque areas. Located in the northwest of England, near the Scottish border and just five hours drive from London, this mountainous region is a popular holiday destination. The Lake District National Park, occupying the region's central area, is the biggest tourist draw. The jewel of the Lake District is undoubtedly Lake Windermere, framed by the highest mountains in the country, some of which reach nearly a thousand meters or approximately 3,300 feet high. At its longest, Lake Windermere extends to nearly 18 kilometers or 11 miles. Along the lake's eastern shore, the small village of Bonus on Windermere charms even from a first glance. For over 150 years, it has attracted lovers of nature and the great outdoors who come to admire this magnificent lake whose depths have been carved out by thousands of years of melting glaciers. But this lake also hides a fascinating mystery. A strange creature lives in its depths, surfacing only occasionally to surprise tourists and unsuspecting fishermen. I saw some strange disturbance under the water. About a foot under the water, I would say, and it was like a a churning kind of motion under the water in a horizontal fashion. I could sense that the boat was going to rock from side to side or have an impact on it. It was three lumps, really. I kind of saw th uh, round about three lumps in the water, the classic kind of Loch Ness shape. I panicked because I'm in the water, I'm alone, and I feel there's something there. What's going to happen? I would describe it as a sea monster um, with a large body, a long neck and a small head. Travelling very fast, uh, so fast that white water was breaking off the, off the humps uh, and it was heading north up the lake. I saw something in the water. Whether it was a monster, I don't know, but I definitely saw something in the water. It was long, it was black, it was moving through the water. Um, what it actually was, I'll leave others to determine. Since 2006, there have been at least eight eyewitness sightings reported, all of which gave similar physical descriptions. The mounting evidence of this unlikely creature continues to disturb local residents. Bowness is the main village on the lake here on Windermere. When the local paper first reported the first sighting of the monster, um, they took the name from a Scottish legend, a folklore in Scotland, where on Loch Ness there is a monster known as Nessie. Um, so they put the two names together and came up with Bow Nessie, which caught on in popular imagination very quickly. Bow Nessie's been seen as uh, really a, um, a dark shape in the waters of Lake Windermere. Generally, we think that she or he might be maybe 20 or 30 metres long with humps and a sort of traditional monster shape. Rumours about a monster had been circulating since at least the 1950s, but it was not until 2006 that Bo Nessie would fully reveal herself in front of two lovers who, like so many others, came to the Lake District on holiday. They remember, as if it was yesterday, a walk they took down by the lake. Sighting was July 2006. It was the end of July. It was a, a warm summer. It was a good summer. Um, we were having uh, lunch with some friends who were staying just nearby at the Dower House next to Ray Castle and decided to go for a walk after lunch. And we walked down to Watborough Point and we were chatting. And um, I heard Steve talking about something in the water and he was pointing and at first I didn't take any notice and then he said, where's my camera? I was looking down on it from the promontory so I may have been about, I don't know, 20 yards away from it, perhaps even closer, I'm really quite close really. And it was clear that it was a living creature and I was, what surprised me most of all, I think, was not just seeing it, but it was the speed at which it was traveling. There was no kind of flapping about or anything. It wasn't like a fish. It was going like a torpedo. 
So it's clearly it wasn't anything other than a, than a living creature. It all happened really quickly because, because of the speed at which it was travelling. And within, I don't know, 20 seconds or something, it was way up the lake. What exactly was seen that day remains a mystery. But subsequent strange sightings have corroborated Eileen and Steve's testimony and lent credence to their theory that something strange inhabits the depths of Lake Windermere. Until the first sighting in 2006, Bo Nessie was more a myth than a monster. Nobody really believed in the existence of a strange creature in Lake Windermere. But the couple's story of their encounter has changed all that. Almost overnight, opinions altered and Steve and Eileen's testimony traveled far beyond England's borders. There's never been any history of uh, anybody seeing anything in this lake, as, as far as I know. So I was the first person, really, to see it. The story appeared in the, in the Westmoreland Gazette in August 2006, and then was, the story was picked up by a lot of the media, both nationally and internationally. It seemed to go around the globe. Somebody told me that quite early on it was in the... Uh, it was in one of the big Indian national newspapers, and, and I have heard said that, uh, you know, it's, it's now kind of got into travel books abroad. It's become a... It's become a, a kind of an established fact, if you like, that there is something in here. In 2007, a man named Lyndon Adams and his wife witnessed their own disturbing scene on the lake, and the pictures Lyndon took made headlines in local papers. All of this excitement and mystery attracted Dean Maynard, a renowned specialist in paranormal phenomena, to come investigate for himself. To document his research, he hired professional cameraman John McKeown. Yeah, close to where we are now on the road behind us um, is where I filmed some shots of a disturbance in the water which I couldn't explain. The nature of my filming that day was to come out on the lake to see if we could capture shots of a creature that Lyndon Adams had photographed from Gummer's Howe to film what people have now dubbed Bonessi. So the shots I took were the establishing shots of the lake. It was a, it was a clear day, it was slightly overcast, but the water was still, uh, and the disturbance I saw I thought was from the local car ferry, so I stopped recording. Later, when I spoke to a local boatman, um, he pointed out that the ferry was a mile further up the lake, so it couldn't have been that kind of disturbance. He couldn't explain it, and neither can I, and I've not had a good explanation of what the footage is. But what do the people of the region believe? Especially those in Bonus on Windermere, the only town on the lake's coast. Are they also convinced of the presence of an aquatic monster in their lake? I think, on balance, most local people are skeptical. Having said that, when the local paper ran an online survey at the time of, um, I think it was one of the subsequent sightings, maybe two or three years ago, they ran an online survey and said, just very simple question, do you believe in, in Bo Nessie, yes or no? And it was absolutely 50-50. And that was among their readership, who are mostly local people. My experience is, is there a fish that's lived there for thousands of years that people have experienced? They've never sort of brought it out into the community for fear of ridicule, for fear of laughter, for fear of being taken as a fool. Well, I can tell you from now, they're not fools, there is something in there. I would class Bonessi as a large mammal, prehistoric possibly, who's been around in Windermere for quite a number of years. and he just chooses to be seen by various people every so often. There has been various sightings 
in the last couple of years and a couple of very credible ones. Myself and Thomas have had an encounter with them and other local people have also had encounters in the previous years. The different sightings reported over the last few years have occurred in both the northern and southern ends of Lake Windermere. England's largest body of water, Lake Windermere, is embedded in the hills of the Lake District, an area whose natural beauty has been perfectly preserved. I describe the Lake District as like the Great Lakes of America, but smaller, like the mountains of Switzerland, but in miniature form, and it's a one-stop travel experience. They can come here, they can uh, visit everything in a week, as opposed to sort of traveling around the country for weeks or months. And here, and here's just with the villages, and it's, it's unspoiled, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful. From maybe if we were here 300 years ago, and I'm sitting here, it's exactly the same view that you would have. Is it possible that so idyllic a landscape is haunted by a lake monster? Half of the area's residents say yes. Between 2006 and 2013, all of the witnesses claiming to have seen Bonessi were, fortunately, outside the water. All of them, that is, except Thomas Noblet, a local hotel owner and champion swimmer who regularly crosses the lake. It was on one such crossing, according to him, that he was literally grazed by the monster. I have had one quite serious meeting with Bonessi a couple of years back. In preparation for a channel swim that I had committed myself to, uh, we had to train. And the best way to train is in the lake. But also, the lake is full of boat traffic. You've got water skiers. You've got the ferries. It's just a constant activity. Uh, so we decided that we'd start early morning swimming. I accompanied Thomas throughout the UK and Europe on various long distance swims that he's encountered. I train him and keep an eye on him when he's swimming as well. The most important thing when I'm out swimming with Thomas is the safety aspect, keeping an eye on him constantly and ensuring that if he got into any difficulties, I'm able to fish him out of the water straight away. We had a very unusual encounter early one July morning a couple of years back when training with Thomas on Lake Windermere. And this particular morning, it was 5.45, and it was a mirror. It was like a mirror. The lake was beautiful. You could see the mountains looked upside down. It was a perfect picture. And I really didn't want to jump in and spoil the tranquility of the, of the lake. We head out to an area just opposite the Langdale Chase Hotel called The Deeps, which is the deepest part of Lake Windermere. It's called The Deeps and it has a very, and it, it puts sort of fear into me as well. And I have swum all up and down the lake. But as soon as someone mentioned the deeps and any swimmer, you recoil because it has that mystique about it. So I got in, I swam and I do what I normally do, get my stroke together and then kind of switch off and just let the mechanics of my stroke get me across to the other side of the lake. Thomas was swimming along, he was in his own little world. I was planning my day, we're talking five o'clock in the morning, I was planning my day, what I needed to do at the hotel. After this, I was swim, and then all of a sudden, we had a bit of a bit of an encounter. I felt this massive thrust go past me. And first and foremost, I thought it was a, a large fish, Then I thought it could have been a speedboat with a, the water skier on the back, and I thought, with the whole lake, we're the only ones on here, why come so near us? And it sent a panic through me. And then, next thing, the boat that I was canoeing in at the time rocked from side to side, nigh on tipping me out of the boat. He was being tossed around, and next thing, I was lifted up and dropped down like a cork. And I looked around, I could see nothing. And I could see the concern on his face. And I said to him, what the hell was that? 
and he was speechless looking down the lake. I just watched in absolute amazement as go down the lake, a bow wave, and then all of a sudden it just sank straight down, whatever this was, disappeared straight down. Nothing's there, like a Mary Celeste. I said, let's get back. I was shaken and I was shocked. And I said, I've just experienced something. I don't think no one's believed me. Here, bonus he was, and I had got to feel him. Many people over the years have said to us different things, or oh, was it not speedboats, was it not somebody water skiing on the lake? We're talking five o'clock in the morning, it was flat calm the lake, it was like glass. There wasn't a soul about, hence why we go out so early. After that experience, I'm a true believer. Lake Windermere is crisscrossed throughout the year by ferries and boats. If a giant creature truly swims in these waters, these mariners are without a doubt the ones best placed to know about it. I'm the managing director of Windermere Lake Cruises. We operate 16 passenger boats on Windermere and those boats will have a crew varying from two on the smaller boats up to a crew of seven. So I've got probably about 40 captains and they spend all their working day on the lake. We sail 364 days a year throughout the hours of daylight. So from first thing in the morning until late in the evening, we've got skippers and crews out on the lake watching, keeping a lookout for other boats, other craft, and for anything in the water. Well, I've, uh, I've worked for the company for about 18 years. So I've been driving these boats for about 12 years, full time on here. So I spent a lot of time on the lake. There are you know, four full-time skippers on these boats. Uh, we spend about 2,000 hours a, a year on the lake. Now, I've never seen an animal on the lake that you wouldn't expect. I, I, I have a list of animals that I see swimming in the lake that you wouldn't expect to see in the lake, but I know what they are. There's a, a pheasant, a gannet, a squirrel, and a deer. In my time here, those are the four animals that you wouldn't expect to see in the lake, but I could identify them. Perhaps they want to believe that there's something here, and they maybe think they do. You know, like on the day to day with lots of waves, you can see ripples in the lake that they might construe to be a, a creature, but it's not something that I've ever believed in. I've only heard descriptions from other people, and as boatmen, we keep our feet very much on the ground or on the boat deck. So we have to see things with our own eyes, really, to believe it. So maybe I'm not just the right guy to ask. It's a fact for me. It's, uh, if there have been eight sightings, that doesn't convince me that it exists. My own sighting convinced me because I absolutely know what I saw. You know, I saw a living creature that was very long, travelling very fast, and it didn't resemble anything I'd ever seen. It certainly didn't resemble anything that should be living in this lake that anybody's ever recorded. So for me, uh, my own sighting convinces me absolutely. And bear in mind that my background is as a journalist, so, you know, I'm kind of a skeptic about most things. I'm skeptical about things until I can prove that they're true. But I have to believe my own, my own senses. I did, I did see it. I was born and raised in uh, Bowness on Windermere. Um, when I was younger, I uh, worked on the rowing boats down on the lake and um, we were out every day, most summers, on the lake itself, uh, in the rowing boats, um, tiring them out to tourists. And to be honest, we've never seen anything mysterious actually in or on the lake, other than tourists. And um, my feeling is that there isn't anything really to worry about um, out there, but obviously I could be proved wrong. question plagues those who believe in the creature's existence. If there really is something inexplicable swimming in the lake, why did virtually no one report seeing it before 2006? Why all of a sudden has Bonessi decided to make so many spectacular public appearances? The first sighting was in 2006, which was 12 months after um, the speed limit came uh, in force on the lake. So the lake was a much quieter place. For 12 months, there had been no speedboats. So anything that perhaps had been living 
at the bottom of the lake or in the depths of the water might have felt encouraged to, um, to show itself. In the spring of 2005, a law was enacted prohibiting boats from traveling faster than 10 miles or 16 kilometers per hour. Apart from the rare occasion that a speedboat breaks this law, the lake is extremely peaceful. My theory is really quite simple. It started appearing because the lake is now quiet. You know, it's not frightened by, by this constant noise. Perhaps in the past it has been popping up at night time when there's nobody around, but now, because the lake is quiet, uh, that's why I think it's appearing. Whatever it is, I think it's appearing because of that. I'm a lake ecologist from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and I've been conducting scientific research on Windermere since 1990. Most of my personal work is to do with the, the fish populations of, of the lake, but I work within a, a research group which looks at all aspects of the lake, from it, its physics, basic elements of its chemistry, through its plankton and other small animals, and up to the, the fish populations. Well, the, the obvious feature of the Lake District are, are the lakes themselves. There's nowhere else in England that has such a diversity and such a number of lakes. And then Windermere itself is the largest natural lake in all of England by surface area, and it's one of the deepest as well. So it may well be that there are other species down at the bottom of the lake because it's such an ancient piece of water and because it's so vast, it's 11 miles in length and because of its depth, then there may well be um, creatures, fishes, large ones, at the bottom of the lake that have not been seen. Windermere is, is inhabited by a number of species of, of fish. And one, the Arctic char, is very localised in England, so it's quite a rare species. We also have large numbers of perch, uh, fish called the roach, and also fish called the pike. And Atlantic salmon and brown trout will come into the lake as well. But the largest of these fish would be the pike or the salmon, and the largest individual we would ever see would still be less than a metre in length. So none of the native fish of the lake could possibly explain sightings of a, of a very large animal. My, my best idea of what the bonetti thing could be is uh, if it is a larger animal than the kind of things that we know are in the lake, my best guess is that, that it's a large catfish that has been introduced a species which is not native to this part of the UK, for sure. And we know that some anglers have brought catfish into the UK for fishing purposes. But these catfish, even in their native part of the world, they don't get large enough to be the kind of size that Bonessi is supposed to be. I, I see no reason why there might not be a, a genetic hybrid sort of creature uh, in the lake, perhaps a very large eel, a very large catfish. My perception of what I think might be in there and what I thought prior to swimming are two different things. If you had asked me prior to my swimming what was in there, I would say large fish, cold water and boats. And in my opinion, there are believers, non-believers or in between us. And people that, you know, I know would never come out with these stories have experienced different things, whether on top of the water, on the side of the water, whether they're sailing, uh, not so much swimming. Uh, they've experienced something very similar. Now, all of us can't be wrong. And what to make of the disappearance of certain fish populations in the lake despite its remarkable water purity? This is a recent phenomenon that has only added to the lake's mystery. And since then, with the questions and asking sailors have been on there, which they've experienced seeing something come towards their boats and rolling over like a slab of meat, then disappearing down. It makes, it could be a, an old prehistoric monster that lives down on the bottom that's feeding on the fish. The lake is not overfished. There's the odd fisherman that goes out there, there's no trawlers, but there's a lack of fish and swimming sometimes, apart from the old fish, we see nothing. And at the bottom, there's char, 
but people are not catching anything and there's no pollution in their lake. It flourishes with all types of wildlife. Um, and it just begs what is eating or why is the fish not bountiful? Despite much of the local population's skepticism about Bonassi's existence, its growing legend, propelled by media reports from around the world, has attracted many tourists to the Lake District. The first sighting was made by a guy here on holiday, uh, so I saw it in our local newspaper. And then it subsequently turned out that the, the, the gentleman concerned was a lecturer in media studies. So my first reaction was, this guy is conducting some kind of research of his own and planting a monster story and seeing how the media take it up. So that, that was the first time I heard these, these ideas. The next thing that happened was um, some photographs were taken of the monster by a professional photographer. And I was shown those before it became public. And my first reaction to seeing the photographs was that they were indeed of something biological out in the middle of the lake, something moving around, some, something real, not, not an artifact. Um, but from my perspective, what I couldn't judge was the, the size of this thing. So it, it looked to me like it could just be a, a cormorant or a goosander or an otter, even a deer swimming in the lake. Sometimes we get deer swimming to the, into the lake. The sightings have all been tourists um, who are perhaps not used to being in the area, seeing the lake, seeing the various moods of the lake, because the mood of the lake can change very quickly. Um, there's lots of uh, different things that can happen. The light can change, um, swells can get up, the wind moves in different places at different times. It can be calm one minute and get up quite uh, blustery the next. mountains as well do cast quite good shadows over the lake. Also there's lots of woodland around the lake um, which means it's very difficult to actually get to the edge of the lake to really look at it and I think probably two-thirds of the lake is private and private woodland and private land around it so most people are going to see Bonessi if they see it from quite a distance and I think you'll find that apart from some canoeists that thought they'd um, seen it while they were on the lake, um, most of the sightings have been from the hills or from a fair distance away. As, as a scientist, when we see hair of most sightings, what we, we desperately want is, is objective evidence for it and good photographs and there really haven't been good photographs so it's the same as a, as a Loch Ness story it just doesn't doesn't produce decent photographs if we grant for the sake of argument that an animal of this size cannot exist in Lake Windermere the question remains what did all these presumably honest people swearing by their testimonies really see One of the ways in which we study the fish of the lake is using echo sounding, in which we go out in the lake in our research vessel and transmit pulses of sound five times every second down into the water. We drive around the, the lake on a, on a set, um, set of transects and we record things in the water column. So that lets us count the fish and it lets us assess the size of those fish as well. And we do that once a month, um, daytime and nighttime since 1990. And so we have good ideas of the changes in the numbers of fish and the changes in the, in the sizes. And we've never seen anything larger than a metre or so, which is the, the maximum size of a, a salmon or a pike that we would see. Some other people have suggested that the thing that's been seen really is an otter or even a, a family of otters at certain times of year. Because the otters are quite common around the Lake District now, much more abundant than they were just a few years ago and they certainly do exist on Windermere and around Windermere. And if you saw something in the water and you misjudged the size of that object, then an otter would fill a lot, fit a lot of the descriptions that have been given. At, at certain times of the, of the year, the, the female otter will be with her cubs. 
So they will be in a, in a family group, as it were. So you can, if you're very lucky, you could see a group of otters moving together on the lake or around the edges of the lake. If the otters are, are close together, you could get the impression that you're looking at one big thing rather than a number of, of small things which are, are nearby. From a, a scientific point of view, I think we can speak with some authority for Windermere because it's the, the lake which has had by far the most scientific study in the whole of the United Kingdom. There have been scientists based at Windermere since the 1930s looking at all aspects of the lake. So it's really remarkable if, if something has existed and has not been detected by all of their sampling over all of those decades. The skeptics say that it's unlikely, but nobody has proved beyond reasonable doubt that there's nothing there. They can't do that. The lake's far too big for them to do that. This is a very old lake. It's an ancient piece of water. It was formed 13,000 years ago. Um, it's very deep. In places, it's more than 200 feet deep. So there may well be things down at the bottom of the water that are not yet to be explained. Another mystery likely to remain unsolved. But no matter what we think, so long as irrefutable proof of the monster's existence has not been presented, there will always be room for doubt. Some will consider this doubt justified and others will think it absurd, but this is the inevitable result of science that at least for now doesn't have all the answers. Bonacy is ultimately not very visible on the lake, but its presence is evident everywhere on the streets of Bonus on Windermere, where the residents have increasingly embraced it. It's now time to pass the monster from science to folklore. I believe there may well be some strange creature in the lake. I'd, li I'd see no harm in believing in folklore and legend. I think folklore is very important to an area. Before 2006, Bowness wasn't part of our lives. And then there were the first sightings, and of course, with the first sighting, you're very skeptical. Then there's another. I think so far there have been eight sightings of Bowness. Tourists can come from far and wide to do their own little investigation into Bowness's existence. Outside of any chance monster encounters, they will discover a charming region filled with natural beauty. It's mainly British visitors, people from the Far East, and in a smaller proportion, people from North America, United States and Canada, and also people from France and Belgium and Holland and Scandinavia. Tourism's incredibly important to the Lake District National Park. Every year, about 15 million visitors come to the National Park. It sustains employment, about 15,000 full-time equivalent jobs in tourism, and the value of tourism to the Lake District National Park, somewhere in the region of a billion pounds. So it's incredibly important. I can't really tell how many of those visitors come to the area looking for Bonessi. Sure, some of them do, but I think probably the vast majority come for the spectacular landscape and the genuinely world-class visitor experiences. One thing that the Lake District is not is Disney World. You know, people come here for the scenery, for the mountains, and for the lakes. But they also come to see Bonessi. You know, I have four hotels with 150 bedrooms of my own. And we ask our guests why they're coming here. And more and more of them are saying, we're coming here for Bonessi. As a coincidence today, it's the first time I've ever been asked this. This was a Chinese family. And they showed they had a Chinese uh, tourist book in Chinese with a picture of what they call what it's supposed to be the Nessie, and he asked me, did I know anything about it? So, but that's the first time I've ever been asked.
Bonessa isn't a tourist attraction in the sense that you know people come to ride on Bonessa um, or people come to see Bonessa toys. They come to see Bonessa on the lake. Of course, they can buy a Bonessi toy as well as a souvenir. But the real attraction of Bonessi is the chance of seeing Bonessi emerge from the depths of the water. You've got to keep your eyes peeled. Don't you let your kids put your feet in the water. They uh, never know about Bonessi may, may be nibbling their tootsies and that sort of thing. So it, we sort of jay it up a little bit uh, to try and get them interested. And they do join in with the fun. And I think it just adds a little bit of fun to their uh, trip. Maybe they'll tell their friends, maybe it'll become a bit of a, a myth and a legend and uh, maybe it'll spread the word that way. Visitors from abroad particularly are very, very interested. The Lake District attracts a great many visitors from China and Japan um, and they like any kind of folklore stories. They love those kind of tales, and they appear to have really fallen for the stories about Bonessi as well. There's now um, a, a storybook for children about Bonessi, and that's very popular. And during the summer, I understand that quite a lot of Japanese and Chinese visitors went on a, a trail that's been set up by, mostly set up for children actually, but um, grown up Japanese and Chinese visitors went on the Bonessi Trail. So I think they, they are curious. We are from China and we come here to study in Lancaster. So we travel here to uh, spend some uh, holiday, yeah, holiday weekend. weekend. We are trying to buy the tickets there so we can listen to the uh, mysterious stories here. So it will be sounds very interesting, I think. During the Middle Ages, dragons held an important place in English mythology. Some of the legends of King Arthur say that, pursued by the Knights of the Round Table, the dragons found refuge in the depths of Lake Windermere for thousands of years. Asian legends and the collective imagination of some areas alongside the Asian seas are also full of dragons and other sea creatures, which may explain why so many of the region's tourists hail from the Far East. Most of the Japanese come because of Beatrix Potter and Peter Rabbit, but the Chinese are coming because of Bonessi. They want to see the British dragon. I think it's very interesting that um, in the ancient history of the Chinese and the ancient history of England, there is a common link. Dragons are part of our national culture and they're part of the Chinese national culture. They're celebrated every new year. And in a sense, the British had begun to forget about dragons. Now Bonessi is back. Bonessi is reminding us that dragons are part of our culture. Legend or not, Bonessi certainly adds a unique flavor to the Lake District. But the tourists, who have been visiting since the arrival of the railroads during the Victorian era, come visit first and foremost for its scenery, reputed to be the most beautiful in all of England. Oh, we love the Lake District. We come here um, probably a couple of times a year, maybe three times a year if we can. Um, we just think it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful and the kids love it and it's the fresh air and, and you know, the beautiful scenery. We 
we don't really know about any monster here. We've never seen one anyway, but we always have a look, look when we're on the boats, but we haven't done yet. It's just a bit, bit of fun, isn't it? We have a little Bonesi display up on the wall, and we have some little stuffed Bonesi toys, some colouring books, some bits and pieces that uh, do spark interest in tourists. They perhaps have never heard of Bonesi until they walk in the shop, and then they see uh, the newspaper cuttings we have up on the wall, and they, uh, they will ask us, what's all this Bonesi thing? And we, we talk to them about it. We have a bit of a joke and say, well, if you have to be careful when you're on Lake Windermere, you never know. To those who argue that the story of a lake monster was invented to attract tourists, the residents of the Lake District have a simple and undeniably true answer. They have never needed a story to attract visitors to the lake's pristine waters and breathtaking scenery. It enables one to experience adventure on a fairly small scale that people who might dream of the Alps and the Himalayas but know they'll never get to the top of a mountain there. They can achieve something here with a relatively modest effort. They can get to the top of quite a difficult climb in a couple of hours and see the most spectacular views. And it's within everyone's grasp. It's all about achieving and realizing dreams. I would like to think that Bonessi does bring tourists to Windermere and the National Park as a whole. I think in years to come, Bonessi could become as big as Nessie up in Scotland. Why not? He's got to have a family member somewhere in the UK, so why not in Windermere? I don't think you would be fully human if you didn't find yourself here and find yourself standing on the edge of the lake and looking out and thinking, you know, is there really something in there? Anything that people can't fathom at, anything that people fear, any mystique, any mention of monsters always attracts the public. Now, here in the Lake District, we're already an established tourism base. It's one of the most beautiful areas in the UK, if not in Europe, and certainly if not in the world. It is a mini Switzerland, it's uh, a mini Rockies, it's a mini Alps, it has everything there. It has the four seasons, you have your spring, you have your summer, you have your autumn, you have your winter, which brings the snows. Each season is a different land when you look across the lake. And no two days when I walk down here, or I'm swimming here, no two days are the same. And the beauty of the Lake District is it's changing scenery, it's changing the atmosphere, and it's just beautiful. Now, Bonessi that comes in, that would attract other people for their own benefits to see what's out there. It can be no harm, and what it does, it attracts people into this beautiful area. I believe there's a monster out there, many don't and they probably would quell the, mis the mystery of Bonessi. But I'm a believer that Bonessi's out there and he's there enjoying the beautiful Lake District like we all do. In one of the deepest lakes in the British Isles, your hair stands in the end, the back of your neck. Swims a camera-shy monster that resembles a giant snake. An evil thing in league with the devil. Something struck the boat. So it was obviously something very large. And there was nothing there but a black whirlpool. It was too obvious what we saw. Confirmed there's something there. In the highlands of northern Scotland, the Morag. She's behind you.
Scotland is a land of mystery and legend, and it is also one of the best preserved natural environments on the planet. This is especially true in the Highlands, where we find fertile valleys, majestic mountains, and beautiful bodies of water, like Loch Morar. This little-known and little-used lake is also home to a monster, the Morag. Nobody knows this place better than Viv de Fren, the superintendent of Loch Morar. My name is Viv de Fren. I'm the Loch superintendent on Loch Morar. This is my 25th season in the Loch. I came for the weekend, believe it or not. <laughs> Never got away again. <laughs> but I like it. I love it here. It is absolutely stunning. But last summer, it wasn't just the view that captivated Viv. Some very believable people have told me the monster exists. And I spend a lot of hours out in that loch. You know, many thousands of hours a year out there. Well, up until this summer, I'd never seen anything that I could even... would even make me, you know, think there could be something there. My daughter and I were driving on the far side of the loch, and there's a high point just before you drop down where you see the loch for the first time at the back of the islands. And the loch was like a mirror. I mean, just like an absolute, not a ripple on it at all. And my daughter said, what's that out there, Daddy? And I looked out across the loch, and, and there were these two things. I, I did take a photograph of them. So they were traveling towards the islands doing, at a guess, 10, 12 knots. Never seen anything like it on the loch before. But they were creating the weirdest wash I've ever seen. It wasn't like a boat wash. There wasn't the big V coming off it, but there was huge disturbance on the surface. I mean, I've seen hundreds of boats out there. I know what they look like. You can still see the, the land. So if it was a boat, surely it would show up as clearly as that. I had my binoculars with me, and it definitely wasn't kayakers. Something very big and just under the surface. I'll show you on the map where. So um, my daughter and I were up about there on the track. And then as we drove down the hill, they disappeared and there wasn't a ripple left in the water. I say my daughter's convinced. There's no doubt in her mind whatsoever. You know, this is the monster. Was it the monster? One thing is certain. These strange waves on the surface of the water left Viv shaken. Who knows? So as I say, it's the only thing in nearly 25 years that made me think, hmm. I'm not so sure, uh, but I mean, it's been seen for hundreds of years. It's not, it's not a myth. I mean, it has been seen. Some of the some of the old local people have seen it loads of times, you know, um, and they've no reason to say they've seen it. You know, they're not getting anything out of it at all. It's not being commercialised. Who knows? Morar is a tiny village of 250 souls on the shores of the lake that bears its name, five kilometers or approximately three miles from Scotland's Atlantic coast. It is the second to last stop on the scenic West Highlands Railway that ends its journey in Maleg, a quaint fishing village that has long been an important market for the inhabitants of Morar. I'm Malcolm Poole. Uh, I work as curator to the local museum, Malig Heritage Centre. Born and brought up here. And that's about it, basically. <laughs> well, it's never been, you know, a prime farming area. Very shallow land, much of it covered with heather. It's very rough country. It certainly meant that uh, people in the area had to look to the sea. And uh, that's, I think, probably been a factor in people's lives ever since humans first came into the area. The, the railway to Malig reached here in 1901. And uh, from being a, a very small crofting and fishing community, uh, it uh, suddenly became an important through route for 70, 80 years. Prosperous period was in the 1970s when uh, modern fishing methods were bringing in phenomenal catches of herring. But uh, that wasn't sustainable and uh, the herring markets moved elsewhere. The herring fishery here never recovered an economic shock that is still being felt in the region and that helped give certain areas their deserted appearance.
by European standards, a very sparsely populated region. Over the last 150 years, things have changed quite a lot. People have moved west. There's no longer the scattering of little settlements of two or three families all around Loch Moher that there were in the middle of the 19th century. Most of those have been abandoned. Loch Moher itself is actually one of the deepest fresh water in Europe. The eastern end, it actually plunges to nearly a thousand feet, which is a depth that you don't reach until you're well out into the Atlantic. It is a large area of water with very few people dwelling around it to see what goes on, so who knows? In this small corner of Scotland, where there are no strangers, the elders love to share their stories of the monster. My name is Eoin MacDonald and I am retired. Oh, this is about 10, 15 years ago, at least, oh, maybe more, 20 years ago. Two of my gentlemen were out fly fishing on the loch and this thing appeared in the middle of the loch. Two white wakes going down the loch. And then a head arose out of it and it sort of moved itself around then the head went down and everything disappeared. We just didn't know what the heck it was. I've seen it again out here, up just the back of these islands there. There's two of us were in a motorboat, you know, in a boat bigger than that. And we've seen this wake on top of the water. It was a calm day, pretty calm day. And it's a wake in this water. And said, what the heck's that? I um, led the boat up and followed this wake, and we could see it in the shallow water swimming away like this. And then once it reached the deep water, disappeared. Your hair stands in the end, the back of your neck, you see. You feel sort of, that's something that's unusual, something you've never seen before. It makes you feel, oh, I don't know. That's been seen a few times by quite a number of people. The final witness on the list is Kathleen McNeil. While she was at her parents' cottage, she saw a strange creature on the lake. It could only be the morag. Well, I was up here when I took okay. the photo. I just came like over here, and I stood here and I took it from here. I was just lucky to be here at the right time with a camera. Yeah. So I was one of the lucky ones. A lot of people don't have proof. I have lived here all my life. You couldn't get a nicer place. But ever since I was born, I've been hearing stories about the monster. And I was desperate to see something, but I hadn't. So I was just so excited and a wee bit overwhelmed. I couldn't believe my eyes, really. Um, there was a couple staying here um, at my mum's bed and breakfast, and they were sitting out just on the deck, enjoying the views, and they shouted in for us to come out because they had seen something in the water. So I ran out and just directly down there, there was two, two black humps. They were quite large, probably to me, they looked about that size, each one, just in the water down there. So when I came running out and I seen, I had my camera and I shouted my dad to come out to see and I managed to take a couple of photos. They actually came in and, and uh, shouted for us to come out and have a look. And my daughter Kathleen came out and looked and she had a phone, she took a photo of it, and I was behind, shortly behind her. That's when I saw like, like two, two humps. It was black to me, it looked like each hump was about that. And the lock was just, it was just like glass, very flat. And as soon as they, they started going under the water again, there was a lot of wake and a lot of movement in the water, just round about the area where they were. So it was obviously something very large. Approximately, it was, uh a third of the way out, you know. So he, uh, they thought it was a whale at first, but you don't get whales in fresh water. But certainly that day there was something, as, as I keep saying. I think when I was describing it to a few people, they, it was kind of similar to what they had seen many years back. There's been a lot of sightings, obviously, and I think some people are embarrassed to say they saw a Morak or saw something that looked like Morak. They said that it must have been the monster, because it was the same thing that they had seen. The descriptions of the creature vary from one story to another, but we usually hear of a body measuring between 6 and 12 meters, or approximately 20 to 40 feet, with a serpentine head. The creature is capable of traveling at high speeds on the surface of the water, its several humps protruding as it goes. The 
The first credible sighting to catch the public eye occurred in 1969, when the fishing boat of William Simpson and Duncan McDonnell was nearly capsized by the monster. Duncan passed away there a few months ago. A few months prior to that, he, we did speak about the monster, and he did mention that when they were coming back from a fishing trip up the law, himself and Willie, in Willie's boat, they got an awful fright. I think it was around about the islands here. Something struck the boat. It kind of lifted the boat over. Duncan says, and when he um, looked to see what it was, and this thing popped up, and he, it was like a big eels. The neck was like a big eel with a face, big face, you see. And they struck it with the oar, and they struck it that hard, they broke the oar. And after that, it, the thing just disappeared to the depth, they said. It's only a few months before he died. I can't remember what they were speaking about, and he mentioned this, which makes me believe uh, it kind of changed my mind from a big joke to, yes, there could be. So, definitely confirms there's something there. At the time, a young man captivated by nature wanted to know more. He shared with us the impact the fishing incident had on him. I'm Adrian Schein. I'm a naturalist. I've now worked on this subject for about 41 years. I began in 1973. Towards the end of the 60s, something rather special happened at Loch Mora. Their boat was allegedly rammed with a water beast of some sort, a big one. And it made the news, and I read about it. I actually have the newspaper article. It said, 60-foot monster attacks Loch Boat. And the story, inevitably, went worldwide. Some people from the Loch Ness investigation came over to Loch Mora, investigated that sighting, that particular event, and then ran a series of expeditions, 1970, 71, 72. And one of their members wrote a book called The Search for Morag. This book is actually full of sightings, about 40 of them. There are two conflicting stereotypes. There is the multi-hump form, and there is the long-necked, shorter-bodied form. They very seldom appear together. And that's when I took things very seriously indeed. The picturesque village of Morar developed following the arrival of the railroad in 1901. But today, it is an extremely quiet hamlet. This is the village of Morar. A guided tour with one of its illustrious residents, Alistair McLeod, former city councillor and one-time proprietor of the village's only hotel. The village is basically one street. It used to be the main road going through here, but it, the highway has bypassed it, and now you have a situation where it is only local traffic that is coming through. Well, this is a motor railway station, and uh, at one time it was a very busy station. We had a, a, sh a post office that sat there, and a little shop back here on the right. Because the village had been bypassed with the road, the post office closed and so did the shop. And the effects of that was felt in the hotel. And uh, the hotel, of course, was built at the coming of the railway in 1901. I was 30 years the proprietor of the hotel. With it being the centre of the village here, we did all the weddings and the christenings and funerals and things like that. So sometimes the only time you met people was at one of those functions, and it was wonderful to have that. It was here, in this hotel, that villagers met to talk about the Morag. And of course, the former owner of the place also had a story to tell. I was out fishing on Loch Mora with a cousin of mine and his two daughters. I would reckon now it would be about 20 years ago, and it was a beautiful, calm evening, and we were sitting in the boat. And about 100 yards away, an object appeared from out of the water. It looked to me like the back of a bull. It was hairy, which caused it to be shiny when the water went on it. I immediately started up the engine of the boat and to head towards it. I wanted to investigate myself what this was, the two girls. And they uh, got very frightened and they were shouting, they didn't want to go, but I wanted to investigate once and for all what was there. And when I arrived, 
it had submerged in the water and there was nothing there but a, a, a black whirlpool. So I stopped the boat on top of it and looked down into the water, but we saw nothing. I can only tell you what I saw. Over the years, many people have saw the monster here and have never spoke about it because uh, it, it's just one of these things that uh, people laugh. Some people that have never saw it don't believe in it. And uh, the, the people, when they do see it, very often they say nothing. The myth of the Morag goes back centuries. At one time, the mere mention of the monster was considered a bad omen. There's been tales about it ever, ever since I was born. I've been hearing stories about the monster. The older generation, a lot of them, they thought it was bad luck. People said if they'd seen the monster, something bad would happen to their family. As I grew up hearing about the monster, it was called locally the Vorak. Some people said it was a sign of the death of a particular member of a particular family. Some people said it was the Gillises, some people said it was the Magdanelles. It wouldn't necessarily mean that, that a local Magdanelle or Gillis had died. It could be somebody in Nova Scotia or even Quebec, a descendant of the people of Mora. Like Nessie, Morag's uh, history goes back to the early Irish monks came to the west coast of Scotland bringing the Christian religion and uh, she's been reported uh, at various uh, points during uh, history. It is said that St Columba, the man that brought Christianity to Scotland, walked on the top of the mountains here the 8th or 9th century probably. He looked down and he referred to the beastie in Loch Morar, that there was a monster in, even in these days. That would make the monster quite old as right. I suspect it's also tangled up with the uh, Celtic mythology uh, as well. Echusha, or water horse, uh, which uh, appears frequently in, in Celtic mythology. You see, there was a widespread folklore tradition in the highlands of Scotland. Tales of the Kelpie or water horse, which actually used to devour travelers, dragging them into the water. A very bad thing, an evil thing, in league with the devil. But even to speak of it suggested that you might be part of the evil. So there was a strong superstition against mentioning encounters and unusual things seen in Scottish locks. But today, the monster has lost much of its evil reputation. But as areas became more cosmopolitan, so these sorts of stories became relegated to warning stories for children, to keep children away from the water, which is a sensible thing. Um, a lot of people also joke around and say that they only see it if they've had too much whiskey. <laughs> um, but there is good tales about it as well. And other people said she was good luck. <laughs> I'm not sure what to believe, to be honest. I suppose I've had a good year, yeah. I got married and, yeah, it's been good. So I'm hoping it's good luck since I've seen her. <laughs> in 1973, Adrian Schein came to these banks in order to investigate the monster of Loch Morar. At that time, no one had solved the mystery of the Morag, and the desire to capture this monster has become an obsession that has monopolized his time for many years. At that time, I was a very young man. Quick fame and fortune awaited uh, this, this national wildlife, natural history problem. Could I solve it? Could I be the one to solve it? I knew that aquatic creatures rise towards the surface at night. So then the place to be is in a little boat, and the time to be there is at night. And I rode around. Lochmora drifting at night in the hope of attracting an encounter. I was rowing along in the dusk and all of a sudden there cruised out into the body of the loch a hump, a big hump. I stopped rowing, it stopped and I began to push on the oars to get closer. And it stopped looking like this great hump, and it began to look like a huge semi-submerged head. 
ripples broke away from it as it started to move towards me. Was it the chance of a lifetime? The moment of truth. <clears throat> I had to cough. <laughs> Suspense. <laughs> and it was a rock, two inches, three inches high. And those ripples that broke away from it were actually the wake of my boat having passed it. I learned then, I learned that night, there is no such thing as a sighting which does not have an alternative explanation. But of course, we don't know whether all the alternative explanations are true. It only takes one of these sightings to be of an unknown animal for the whole issue to change. Adrian Schein had no luck this time, but the residents of Loch Morar have been on the lookout for decades, and the mystery continues. My name is uh, Alistair McKellig. I'm involved in the fishing industry, lived in this small village of Malig all my life. As I say, my brother saw it, my two younger sons were aboard the boat. We all saw the same thing. Well, we're just out in a local fishing competition, which we regularly have in Loch Mora, and totally flat calm, not a movement in the loch. My brother turned around and said to me, do you see these three humps in the water? And as we turned around, we saw three humps. And of course, we didn't have any camera aboard the boat at the time, but someone made a sketch just on the evidence that we're hearing. But it's a good representation of what we saw. We normally fish maybe it's only seven yards from the shore, very close in. We saw this three humps, maybe 50 yards behind the boat. And the humps came basically alongside the boat, past the boat, and totally disappeared. Where we saw this creature or whatever, it's the deepest area of the loch. I think it's 330 metres deep. Uh, there was no boats close by us. The nearest boats were probably four or five miles from us. So and it was just a, tr a strange feeling. We, 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 couldn't, we couldn't explain what the movement was in the water and why it suddenly disappeared. Our local newspaper passed the story on to the national press. In fact, front page of the paper it was as well. Then it just went from one newspaper to the next over the next few weeks. It says, lock up your loved ones. Run for your lives. She's scary, she's slimy, and she's back. The terrible creature of Amora has surfaced again. You know, we, we don't know if it's one creature or maybe more. We don't know if everyone's seen the same thing. Yeah, that's still a mystery. But I know there's something there. But Adrian Schein did not quit. Given the abundance of testimony, he decided to continue hunting the monster and refining his research tools. One of the things that I noticed, but at Loch Mora, when I looked over the side of that rowing boat, the water was very clear. And I thought, I shouldn't be sitting around waiting up here. I should be sitting around waiting down there. And so over the winter of 1973 to 74, I built a small submersible observation chamber to look upwards against the surface in the hope of seeing a great silhouette swim over the top because that a large predator might patrol along the shallow water. We could stay in there for about two hours and um, I had a camera of course in there and we baited it to attract fish and of course we hoped something larger. And yes, we saw lots of fish. We didn't see any large creatures. And then the next year, in 75, we thought that there might be some skeletal remains. Maybe if an air breather had died, it might have come close in shore to make breathing easier. And so I built a little glass-bottomed boat, uh, which we surveyed all the shallows, 200 miles of shallows around Loch Mora. Residents still remember the crazy exploits of the young scientist. When I first met him, it was 41 years ago. He, he was admired for the amount of work that he put in looking for this. And he's probably spent a lifetime doing it. And he's still looking for something. I hope he finds it before he goes to the happy hunting ground. They probably point him in the right direction when he gets up above. 
This is the way to where I used to have a base camp during the 1970s. It was after I'd used the little submarine. Uh, my expeditions had got a little bigger. I had uh, some logistic support from elements of the British Army. We've had up to 100 people on this site, uh, but that was a long time ago now. We came here because it was flat ground, a good launching beach for the assault boats of the Royal Engineers, which used to take my crews down the lock with the underwater television. We were not successful with that. It was fun, they were great days, and it, uh, a lot of it happened right here. Despite decades of research, Adrian Schein was never able to prove beyond a doubt the Morag's existence. He has even grown skeptical over the years, but as a scientist, he strikes to keep an open mind, and he never hesitates to return to the lock. After all, who knows? I've known Adrian for a few years now. He is a non-believer in the monster, but he wants to prove scientifically that it's not there. Sometimes some of the scientists that I work with would like to come and do work here. And so we come and Vivian helps us. And he is on the lock in the course of his duties a great deal. And so if there's one man who understands this, this lock, it's going to be Vivian Dufresne. What proofs on that are ready to go. Together, Adrian Schein and Viv Dufresne combine over 50 years of experience on the lock. And today, he returns to track down the monster. I was here each summer from 1973 until 79. Uh, well, we did come here in the winter, actually, as well. I did some diving here in the winter. We're bloody mad then. You know? <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> Did you see the pictures in the paper from the bed and breakfast last summer? We were staying one of the bed and breakfast just along here. We've got a very bad photograph yeah, of, of the monster. Yes. They were on the sun deck or something, so it would have been out here somewhere. Well, what did you make of that? It's certainly in a deep bit of the lock. It's not a rock, no. and it is something large on the surface. Viv Dufresne was a diehard skeptic until one day in the summer of 2014 when strange waves appeared on the lock. The two men returned to the exact spot where this strange phenomenon occurred. Where I was. Yeah, where that's where you? See where the, the, the dip in the plantation there? Yes. That's where, that's where I was, just on the right-hand side of that. Whatever it was, was this side of that point, between that point and this point of the island. I'd love an, an explainable answer. So I can go back to Mr. Total Skeptic again. <laughs> <laughs> But for Malcolm Poole, director of the Maleg Heritage Centre, Scottish lake monsters are the stuff of legend. One quite plausible explanation for some uh, sightings are, are driftwood, and uh, giant eels have been mentioned as a possible explanation as well. To be honest, deer are at the top of my list. They, they've been photographed swimming considerable distances from the shore to feed on the island. So that, that is a possible explanation. And we surveyed in 1975, 200 miles of the shoreline, and we went all the way around the shore looking for bones, skeletal remains. Using a little glass bottom boat, found an awful lot of sheep and deer bones, but we didn't find anything, uh, anything uh, unusual. looking for the sorts of things that people see and sometimes believe they are seeing large animals. Perhaps they are and perhaps they're not. Things like boat weights, things like what we're generating now, but it's disappearing. The waves we are making can sometimes look like those multi-humps, what I call the sea serpent type sightings. That can happen. Adrian and Viv are en route to the place where there have been the most sightings. I mean, most of the ones I've heard of recently are down this end, it has to be said, but, but then not so many people go further up the loft now. You know, it's, um, it can be a dangerous place. Oh, yeah. Well, the canoeist that we lost last summer, 
it was blowing worse than this and they were up at the head of the loch and one of them drowned and and it can happen so quickly too yep. it can really happen quickly you've always got to have an escape plan it can change in a second <laughs> yes. i mean you're not even seeing half of the length of it here the, the sunlight on the hill and the distance there that's about halfway up the loch so you've got the same again before you get to the top of it a large area of water with uh, mountains around. The wind does play tricks on the water and on a number of occasions I've seen things that made me look closer, but uh, I always came up with an explanation for, for strange patterns on the water. Because we're lying in the shelter of an island, the wind comes over the top and strikes down onto the water. And we call that a cat's paw. And that can happen there's Parker. one, there's one. But if you were on the shore now and high up, you might see that as an animal surfacing and coming towards you with a wake. There are all sorts of things that water does which can be mysterious. Uh, there's as much rationality as imagination that goes into what people see. There's generally something that they are seeing. It's just a question of how we interpret it. Adrian Schein and Viv Dufresne are still on the hunt for the Morag. She's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> you. Just keep your eyes open. Well, Ewan and John McVarish reckoned they saw one in the islands here when they were fishing. And it was very calm and they saw it under the water and it and shot off into the deep. Yeah, this is it. Get it. This is it. Takes some doing, doesn't it? But chasing a lake monster is a bit like fishing. It's best to be patient and enjoy your time outdoors. Look at that rock down there. That's a uh, big rock. It's like, uh, Just the size of it. Look at that. As far as I'm concerned, we've succeeded really well. Usually successful day. <laughs> but if you saw her every day, it wouldn't be a mystery anymore. No, that's right. The popularity of these mysteries lies partly in the attempts made to investigate them. And investigators sometimes have results. And sometimes, of course, the results are less mysterious. Although many residents say they saw Morag, Adrian Schein now believes that this monster is a product of the imagination. We are confident now that the multi-humps, the multiple hump sightings, are actually boat wakes. And that is where we begin to study the psychology of human perception. The color is virtually always described as dark. Sometimes the skin is described as shiny as in reflective, as in wet. It was a dark colour, you know, dark greyish black colour. It was black, dark. It was definitely dark, dark grey or black, it was dark colours. But then it often would be because when you look at water, which often is reflecting light, silvery light, uh, you see anything uh, against that background, it will always appear dark, though it can also be characteristic of waveforms. Reports of size vary. The size here has been suggested as some 30 feet or more. It was two large humps. To me, it looks like each hump was about that. The, the, the total length of the humps may have been, I'm sure we've got to talk about 20 feet or six meters. You know, the circumference they got on it. I'll say between six and 20 feet. We need context to judge size. In fact, the context that we, we require 
is distance. We can judge distance if we are on a textured surface, one like a patterned carpet, for example, but also if we are looking at waves, because the waves are a sort of pattern. As they recede, as the range increases, so the waves get smaller visually. And so that gives us a rough idea of distance and therefore size of scale. And guess when sightings are made? And it was a beautiful, calm evening. And totally flat, calm, not a movement in the loch. And the loch was just, it was just like glass, very flat. And the loch was like a mirror. I mean, just like an absolute, not a ripple on it at all. Seen this wake on top of the water, it's a calm day, pretty calm day, and it's a wake in this water, and so what the heck's that? And that, that's what makes it harder to explain, because it was so obvious what we saw. And if you have no clues to distance, you will not know how big an unrecognised object is. Is it conceivable that a little a bird with a neck so big could actually be mistaken for a monster with a neck so big? These are explanations which are possible alternatives, though it doesn't necessarily mean the explanation is true. But Adrian Shine's love of Loch Morar, to which he has devoted decades of his life, continues unchanged. Now that he no longer believes in the monster, he's determined to prove it doesn't exist. What I did was to try and use the conventional scientific techniques to examine the environment, all the organisms at the very base of the food chain. And the conclusion has been uh, both a Loch Mora and a Loch Ness, that there is not really sufficient food resources to sustain a viable a resident population of large predators. It does not, of course, preclude the possibility of large creatures possibly coming from the sea. Loch Mora is actually closer to the sea than Loch Ness, but there's a problem there, and it is the fact that you've got a dam and a waterfall at the base of the River Mora, which feeds into the sea, uh, and a bit of a barrier for larger marine creatures like seals, like sturgeon, to come into it. But the full weight of science means very little to those who have seen the Morag with their own eyes. And remember, there are many such witnesses. So um, I do definitely believe in the monster. I think there's definitely something there. That day, what we saw that day, it, it didn't convince me it, there is more like there, but there is something there. That's, that's definitely something there. It's... Prior to me seeing it, I would probably be like everybody else and say that there wasn't such a thing in the law. I'm not a total believer in the monster angle. Uh, I think there could be something there. Well, there's obviously something there. I could a picture of it, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> and that, that's what makes it harder to explain. It was so obvious what we saw. The more you speak to people that saw something, the more I believe there is something there. Things like this are, are probably better undiscovered. It uh, would take all the mystery out of it if, we, if there definitely was one and we'd discovered it. No, we, we don't know if it's one creature or maybe more. We don't know if everyone's seen the same thing. Yeah, that's still a mystery. Uh, but I mean, it's been seen for hundreds of years. It's not, it's not a myth. I mean, it has been seen. Some of the, some of the old local people have seen it. And they've no reason to say they've seen it. You know, they're not getting anything out of it at all. It's not being commercialised. Loch Ness immediately uh, optimised the sightings to become quite promotional in their attitude. That was not true at Loch Mora. Monster or myth, one thing is certain, the people of Morar do not want to turn their village into an amusement park. I wouldn't like to see Morar become a Loch Ness. It's a beautiful place to live and it's very peaceful. 
and we're quite happy to keep it that way. In the summer, tourists, we get tourists, but not, not even then, not, not like Loch Ness or something. We've got thousands and busloads of them everywhere, you know. And I wouldn't really like Loch Mora to become like that. I would never like to see it commercialised like it has been at Loch Ness. Although we've got our little resident, possibly, um, give it our little secret. Maybe I'm being selfish, but when you love a place, you want to keep it all to yourself, basically, isn't that right? Most of the tourist trade is in summer, but you get a small number of people uh, drifting through in winter as well. People just come here for hill walking. A few miles to the north of us, we've got three peaks that are over 3,000 feet, which uh, attract uh, a lot of mountaineers each year. It's one of the attractions of the area. Boat trips uh, out to the islands, white beaches to make you think you're in the Caribbean when the weather is a bit brighter than today. It's the main beaches for this part of the country around about here. The waters are very safe, very warm as well, and very beautiful as you can see. And for now, the steam train remains the most popular tourist attraction. In, in 1984, the railway company tried a special steam service between Fort William and Mallee, but it became world famous when uh, it was used in the Harry Potter films. So now we have hundreds of people every day just to travel across the viaduct that figures in the films. As for Adrian Shine, he has since devoted his research to the Loch Ness Monster. And that's what led to Operation Deep Scan in 1987, which was a very, a very large expedition. We did sonar patrols, and we did get a series of contacts that we didn't understand. Just because I don't understand my sonar contacts doesn't mean they're monsters, it might just mean that I don't understand. And a new theory is gaining popularity on the lock. What if Morag and Nessie of Loch Ness are the same creature? Somebody did mention uh, in the past that they're making out there's a big tunnel below the hill to Loch Ness. Because both lochs run parallel to each other, they thought there could be maybe tunnels connecting the two lochs. And we could be having a sheer monster here. They thought it maybe it could be the monster from Loch Ness that had come into Loch Mora. No, no, no. That, that's one theory. I mean, I've heard the theory, but it's certainly not one. It's a long way to have a tunnel. It's a long, I mean, it, <laughs> it would have to be one hell of a tunnel. I, no, I don't believe that for one minute, but... But as far as I'm led to believe, there was inconclusive, so... We've got a Mora monster and a Loch Ness monster at this stage. I suppose you could say this, that if a lot of people, a lot of honest and sober people, see large animals, and we go and look and find large animals, that's not a big deal. If a lot of people see large animals, in a large Scottish loch, and there are not animals there, then that is more interesting, not less. On an island in Northern Ireland, a disturbing creature terrorizes those who dare to venture near. This big giant head that swung around and suddenly it's staring me. This guy was huge. The wife was there, and most of her insides were outside. There is something quite large making quite large kills on the island. It's known as the Dovar Coup. Mysterious, yes. And maybe all wild places have a bit of mystery to them. Ireland is breathtaking scenery and savage nature. Visitors get lost in its emerald green plains never far from the roar of the sea. Here, the fantastic and the far-fetched form part of the local culture. From lucky charms to ghost stories, century-old Irish legends live on among the locals, eager to pass them on. But one Irish monster has caused more of a stir than the others, a creature resembling a giant otter that emits a blood-curdling scream the Dovar Coup. Sean Corcoran believes he encountered the creature in 2003. He had the scare of his life while camping with the family on Omi Island, northwest of the country. It was 2003. 
My wife Miranda and I took off um, on a holiday around Ireland and we decided to stay on an island just off of the mainland called Omi Island. Uh, we parked the jeep uh, right at the centre of the island, really, uh, next, quite close to the lake. There's a freshwater lake in the centre of the island. And we set up camp there. It was a lovely evening. Um, we had a tent, so we went, by the time we had gone to bed, um, we heard we'd lights out. We were literally nearly asleep. And the next thing, uh, we heard some noises uh, down at the lake. This particular night, we were sound asleep and we got woken by a really, really loud splashing noise. It was about two o'clock in the morning. And I suppose we were feeling a bit mischievous. So we decided, let's go down and have a look. And we tiptoed down across the short grass, the 15 or 20 metres to the, the edge of the lake, and I turned on the head torch. And there in front of us, as close as you are to I, uh, was the creature. I kind of almost see it as this big giant head that swung around and suddenly it's staring me meanly in the face. And it got up on its back legs and just really hissed at the two of us really loudly. It was just like, oh my God, what is that? And within seconds, uh, it swam across the lake, climbed up onto a boulder on the other side and we never saw it again. And that was it. And we were kind of left standing there speechless. What was that? After that, we went for our lunch over to the local pub on the mainland. And we were sitting there and we were saying, well, we, well, we asked them, what do you think? So we did, we said it to them. The whole pub went quiet. So we were like, ooh, we've uncovered something here. You know, our love affair for Omi began then. The pub the Corcorans are talking about is Sweeney's, located on the shore facing Omi Island in the city of Claddagduff. Mary Sweeney is the pub's owner, and despite herself, the village's amateur historian and spokeswoman. Here, everyone knows Mary. Sweeney's Bar, Claddagduff, I suppose, were known as the information point for Omi. The area that we live in is um, a very beautiful area, as you see. We're overlooking Omi Island, which is uh, a very special island. It's really uh, a, the jewel in Connemara. Over the years, uh, the Office of Public Works would have uh, spent some money in doing an excavation over there to see what period uh, it would all have dated back to. And they've come up with some very interesting finds. Michael Gibbons is an archaeologist. According to him, Omi Island is a place rich with history, even if it is now deserted. Well, the island was first settled six, seven thousand years ago. And like everywhere else here, it's got episodic pulses of settlement onto the island over that period. So you've had hunter-gatherer populations came there eight thousand years ago. Six thousand years ago, agriculture was developed here, adopted from the continent. Two and a half thousand BC, this beautiful pottery has been exposed by the storms and so on, a whole pattern of episodic waves of settlement. When the climate is warm and dry, people expand out onto these islands. When it gets wet and cold and miserable, bogs grow, landscape changes, and people are driven off the edges uh, from the marginal land onto the better land. In the 1840s, of course, you had the Great Famine, which wiped out this area, where you had cannibalism recorded in the Clifton district. That's how bad the, the famine was here. So there's lots of abandoned homes, abandoned farms from the 1840s and 50s here. Shane Dunphy recently made a documentary for Irish Public Radio on the creature of the Omi Island, the terrifying Dovar coup. There's something very peaceful and something very wild and something very lonely about the island. I have to say that if, if there's anywhere in Ireland where there's going to be a monster or a boogeyman, Omi Island is an ideal spot, it's an ideal location. You could believe that something, something strange would make its home there. In ever mysterious Ireland, one man dedicates his life to creatures not yet identified by science. I am Ronan Coughlin, one of the few cryptozoologists in Ireland. If you don't know what a cryptozoologist is, it's somebody who studies animals that are rumoured to exist, but whose existence has not been proven. The sense of mystery 
has always enveloped me. I have always felt there is far more to life than we know. Sean Corcoran has shared his monster encounter with various specialists. I suppose down through the years, uh, we've been asked by uh, lots of people in television, uh, newspaper, magazines, books, authors, uh, people who are into cryptozoology have come to us and said, what was it like? So as an artist myself, I've actually done, uh, done some digital drawings uh, to represent what I imagine it must have looked like. He is not someone who claims to have seen this while staggering home at night from the pub, a bottle of Guinness in one hand and a bottle of whiskey in the other. His sighting was under the right conditions. Secondly, being an artist, he had an eye for detail and took things in. He was, of course, able to make reproductions of what he had seen. So all in all, he is what would be regarded as a reliable witness. It's a kind of a, like a large uh, otter-like creature with a very large head, um, possibly teeth. Very scary face. Uh, it definitely had a tail. Uh, it could swim as fast as any creature, you know, any kind of water-like creature like uh, an otter or anything like that. And we watched what to me looked like two huge, big, reddy, orange flippers just swimming across the lake. It was about the size of a man. This guy was huge. You know, you wouldn't just pick it up and walk away with it. Well, you certainly wouldn't be approaching this creature because the way it snarled, it was definitely not happy. After a few years of Sean researching that, um, we discovered that there was a creature there called the Dover Coo. This disturbing creature seen by Corcoran has haunted the banks for centuries. You can pronounce it Dovahu or Dorhu. In Ireland, the earliest mention I know of regarding the Dovahu is that of Roderick O'Flaherty, who lived in the 17th century. He describes how someone he knew was set upon by it on one occasion and it seized the unfortunate traveler's head in its jaws. The traveler had a bit of a think as the otter was dragging it into the water. And suddenly, he remembered he had a knife in his pocket. He doesn't seem to have been the quickest of thinkers, but he pulled this out, plunged it into the Duvaku, which dived back into the water. About a century later, a tragic incident was reported from Glenad Lake. On this occasion, a man named Connolly was wondering why his wife was taking so long doing the washing in the lake. Down he went to the lake to discover an horrendous sight. The wife was there and most of her insides were outside and the Duvaku was tucking into them. And if you go into the graveyard near where the incident occurred, you'll find the tombstone of the unfortunate woman and a very curious beast that looks like a cross between a dog and an otter is carved on the tombstone. This is said by locals in hushed tones, because you always speak of such things in hushed tones to be the beast which killed his wife. And Corcoran is not the only one to have seen the Dovar coup recently. In the 1960s, um, again, around the Galway region, there was a series of sightings. Um, a lady was hanging out the clothes in her back garden on the shores of Strahin Lock, and uh, literally one apparently came up out of the lake into her garden, and she spotted it. Uh, there was a doctor driving home from a, a house party late at night, and one ran across the road in front of his car, and all of these sightings were recorded and reported in the newspapers of the time. And when I started speaking to people, particularly people living in the west of Ireland, there was almost an acceptance that it's really there, that it is part of the flora and fauna of, of Ireland. 
So I, I decided that the only thing that I could do was really go to Omi Island, which is a t small tidal island off the west coast of Ireland, just off Connemara. And I, I decided I would spend a few days there camping out, uh, bring my recording equipment with me, because I had this notion of making a radio documentary about it. And um, I, I did, and I went out there expecting to find absolutely nothing, but to spend a lovely few days bird watching and enjoying myself, having a little bit of solitude and I recorded a little over six hours of this atmospheric sound. Uh, when I sat down and started putting that documentary together, I was cutting out bits of, of my six hours of Atmos and overlaying them. And I was playing back listening to it when I heard this very strange sound coming over and I realised it was coming from this Atmos track. So I immediately went back to my original recording and I discovered that at about 8.38, on that first evening, my Zoom box had recorded about three minutes of a very, very unusual sound. And it did send some shivers down my spine when I heard it first. It's just a few moments of kind of bird noise and atmosphere, so it'll come in now in a sec. There you go. The mysterious Omi Island is located in the Connemara region in the northwest of Ireland. For the archaeologist Michael Gibbons, the island and its surroundings are a must-see for anyone wanting to discover Ireland. If stones could talk, those on Omi Island would tell all of Ireland's history. The landscape is so diverse, it's like one vast history book that the pages are still being found and revealed, so it's very exciting as an archaeologist. We're looking out on, um, on Cleggan Bay in the northwest tip of Connemara, which is on the very westernmost part of Ireland. On the east side of the beach, you have a small megalithic tomb, which dates to around 3000 BC. And on the west side of the beach, behind us, overlooking it, there's a children's burial ground. Children who died without baptism under Catholic canon law were forbidden to be buried in consecrated ground. So either side of the, the beach, you have five millennia of Irish history. Connemara, it's like a continent in miniature. The centre of it has a series of mountain ranges. The western and southern edge is glacially scarred with beautiful bays and inlets. So it's almost like a little island in itself. It's got every possible landscape known to man. And of course, the sea dominating it and getting its name from the sea, the Con McNamara. So along the shore here, you've got successive layers of settlements over millennia. So the very bottom of it is 7,000 years old. But these walls are from an abandoned village from medieval times on top. So you get these layers of history, one on top of the other. So what we're looking at here is a megalithic tomb. And inside it, you will have dozens of burials, mostly cremation burials with pottery vessels, stone artifacts, lithics, and so on inside it. This site itself has never been excavated. And the earliest of them date back to 3,800 BC. So we found about 40 of these tombs. And we have this extraordinary 18th and 19th century abandoned homes scattered throughout the west of Ireland, but particularly in the Connemara region. It's one of the really nice things about exploring the Irish landscape. Every round, every corner, there's antiquities. To understand the origin of Dovarku, we must return to the very roots of Irish history. This creature has been part of Irish mythology for over a millennium. Dovarku, from my knowledge, is a kind of a, you know, it's a half otter, half dog creature that was of, of quite scale. And I suppose if you look back in the historic uh, annals in Ireland, there's, there's archives of creatures uh, like this, killing people and attacking people and running after people through Connemara and stuff like that down through the centuries. The Dover who originally appears in the Oceanic cycle of Celtic mythology. It's set around the time of Christ in Ireland and it describes this kind of Celtic twilight world where gods and men are, are, are fighting and having all sorts of high adventures. And the Dover who in that story is supposed to be the king of the otters. It's supposed to be a very, very large otter with a white cross on its breast. Remember, this is the beginning of Christianity in Ireland. But somehow it has made the leap from the pages of folklore into the real lives of people in 21st century Ireland. And uh, 
I think that that's a, that's a very interesting point and it's something that fascinates me a lot, the, the transmission of these, of these stories. It is certainly a plausible kind of animal. It's not a three-headed monster that breathes fire from one end and fumes from the other. Well, it may breathe fumes from the other, but I don't really know. They inhabit the wild country. Now, there's a lot of wild country in the west of Ireland. There, thunderous breakers smash against crags on the seashore. Wild grasses that have never known the farmer's scythe grow in a state of pristine purity. Lakes that humans rarely, if ever, walk past are to be found there. It is in such places the Duver who is found and also off the coastline. There's one theory that they come inland to drink fresh water from freshwater lakes. It seems to be quite capable of coming up on the shore, as we have heard from the legends, and devouring the odd passerby if it happens to want a snack. These ancient legends, handed down from generation to generation, have made the Irish born storytellers. We are a, a nation of storytellers. We love a story, a good story. Whether it's a true story or a not true or a non-true story or a folklore or a slightly exaggerated, but you know, the ones that have an element of truth to them are they make for interesting stories, whether they can be scientifically proven or not. Legend has it that this creature is there on Omi. The fact that Sean saw something that fits the bill, having not heard of it before no, he saw it. it before. Like to him, it was this midnight, late night fright. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, it wasn't something that was stirred by imagination that he was uh, seeing after hearing all these stories, that he was on the lookout for something to spin a yarn on himself or to tell a story. I saw that thing. I mean, he just came across this by, by, by chance and it just happens to fit into what is a wonderful legend and story, or maybe not legend and story, maybe fact and never let the truth or untruth get in the way of a good story, as the, as the saying goes. Omi Island is just one kilometer or half a mile from the shore. And yet once there, visitors have the impression of being completely cut off from the world. The sense of isolation is total. There's something very peaceful and something very wild and something very lonely about the island. Um, I remember that, that first night that I was there, you, you sit there and you watch the tide coming in and enclosing you. There's a real sense that you have been, you've been cut off from the world and in some ways it's like kind of stepping into a time machine because, you know, the island is, 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 is pretty much the same as it was back in the, the Stone Age. Uh, the, the lake itself is in kind of a basin um, in the right in the center of the island. It's, it's a freshwater lake. One thing that I did discover was some very, very large animal droppings with very large mussel shells in them. These could be found around the lake. And I also came across the freshly killed body of a greater black-backed gull. This is the largest seabird that we have in Ireland. They, they're very, very large animals. They've got a wingspan of over five feet in length. You would want to be quite a large animal to take down one of these. So there is something quite large, making quite large kills on the island. Um, but as I've said, what it is, I'm really not sure. There is an atmosphere there that not everybody sees or, or, or appreciates or feels. But f I suppose, for me, really, when you're on the island and the tide closes behind you, then you can really experience kind of like being cut off from the rest of the world, being cut off from the mainland, and that's a really kind of a beautiful sensation. Mysterious, yes. And maybe all wild places have a bit of mystery to them. And it is, it is it's, it's remote and it's out there. And I suppose there's a, the, the fact that you're cut off from the mainland for half of the time that you're there. Because it's a tidal island, you drive out to the island when the tide is low and then the tide comes up around you. So that there's that maybe slight tension that's created from being cut off from the mainland for stretches of time. 
In addition to being a place filled with mystery, Omi Island also offers the unique opportunity to capture a living monster, says cryptozoologist Ronan Coughlin. If you go swimming in the area they've been reported and you find something sinking its teeth into your leg, then you may have proved the existence of the Duvahu. Fame and fortune will await you. The Nobel Prize for Science will be thrust in your face. This fan of mythic monsters and local legends prepares to confront the Dovar coup for the first time. I've not been to Omi Island, but I'm sure I'll familiarize myself with it fairly quickly. And uh, if the Dovar who should emerge and show fierce uh, tendencies, you will be quite surprised at how fast I can run bearing my age in mind. Let's go. Fearing nothing. There are no highways to Cladigduff, the village facing Omi Island. Visitors have to take the scenic Sky Road, which runs along the ocean. To get there from the capital city of Dublin, it takes about three hours by car. Well now, there is the place we seek just outside Cladigduff. We should arrive there in three spaces of time. We want to get there before nightfall, because after nightfall it is said that the Duvahu emerges from its watery lair. If there is any anomalous animal out there, no matter how quietly we proceed, it'll hear us coming. Let us just hope it isn't in a hungry mood and is lurking behind a hedge waiting for our arrival. There are two low tides each day. Miss your window and you'll be on the island overnight. It's pretty much the kind of topography I expected. And in the midst of it is uh, Fahi Lake where this uh, creature was allegedly seen. But until the tide goes down, we won't be able to walk over there. But everything comes to him who waits, as they say. Patience is a virtue. There have always been the wild places, the places where it is said that angels fear to tread. It is in such places the Duva who is found and also off the coastline. This is a fine vantage point you get the complete vista of the lake. Yes, this would seem to be the place to watch from. There's one theory that they come inland to drink fresh water from freshwater lakes. It certainly could swim down to here, get out and go down to the lake. There are huge patches of dung of some kind of animal here quite a large animal from the destruction it has left in its wake. Come forward and mind where you step. We're approaching Lake Fahi now. I wonder if you can hear the chill breeze blowing in from the lake. Does it portend a sudden surprise, I ask myself. The Dufaku is said to emerge at night time. As it's the middle of the day, our chances of seeing anything odd are somewhat limited. But if we continue to scan, you never know. Sean Corcoran saw something, something that seemed so unusual, so out of the ordinary, it gave him a terrible fright. Let us see if we can get round to the other side of the lake and see what we might find. I suspect this path is man-made, but if it was made by the Duva who, he did us a great service. The waters of the lake look as though they could conceal just about anything. They're certainly large enough to contain a monster of the type the Duva who is supposed to be. 
Now, if you take a good look, that rock out there looks like it's the head of something, but of course it's only a rock. However, in the wrong visibility, it could be mistaken for an animal. With a little touch of imagination and perhaps a drop of whiskey in you, you could easily make that out to be an otter of unusual size. Now, there are considerable signs of droppings, particularly in the wilder side over there, but I think we may attribute those to cattle let on to the uh, grassy verges of the loch from time to time. There is no way I know of that could be used to make the Duvahu surface, to summon the Duvahu, as it were, and lead it on to the shore. The only thing one can do is watch and wait. Now, as it was seen under cover of darkness, someone who was supposed to camp out overnight might be more lucky. In this small corner of Ireland, local folklore of the Dovar coup is enthusiastically embraced. But scientists are reluctant to grant that such an improbable creature exists. My name's Dr. Colin Lawton. I'm a mammal ecologist in zoology in NUI Galway, which is the university in Galway City here in Ireland. Being an island, it's difficult for the animals to make it here. Now, some of them are brought in by humans and some of them made it here on their own bat. Um, but generally what you would have uh, on an island like this, you would have otters and stoats and rabbits and maybe foxes and quite a lot of small animals like uh, wood mice, maybe shrews, those sorts of things. They get to about a metre 20, a metre 30 in length, which is about four foot in length, but um, that would be as big as they'd get. Uh, they wouldn't really get up to the sort of seven foot long. That I, that I heard of. <laughs> there is no proof that would be acceptable to a mainstream scientist that it exists. On the other hand, there is a considerable body of anecdotal evidence which in previous cases of unknown species has led eventually to the discovery and scientific acceptance of the species. Now, what is it that we don't know that's going on around about us as we go through life. There could be animals hiding in the densest forest which have not been discovered. In fact, no scientist would deny there are animals that have not been discovered, but they like to think that all the big ones have been discovered. You're never too far away from a house and there are people about and a, a large animal, I would be surprised if one was able to get around without being noticed more often than, than perhaps the records have shown. Let's walk along the shore a bit and see if we can discover. Because if the Duva who ever comes out on the shore, any droppings it leaves will be on the beach. I don't think we're going to be very lucky. According to Dr. Colin Lawton, it is not a mythical Dovar coup, but humble otters that have disturbed unsuspecting visitors to the island. They spend most of their active time in the water, but then they, um, they come out of the, the water and they nest on land. So they nest in holts, just in the banks of the, uh, the lake or river, or even just along the, the beach. So um, you would be talking about something that's resident in the country, and you would, um, I, I would expect that we would have seen it and recorded it um, quite regularly, given the size of the animal. And for the rest of the evening, this is the place to stage the lookout. Down there, on the very edge where I can look out from that uh, slightly elevated piece of ground over the whole of the lake. And snugly ensconced in my car, I shall keep my eyes out for the dreadful Duvarku. Scientists can be rather na narrow-minded sometimes about where the boundaries of the possible lie. We're all like that a bit, I suppose, because e each of us has a kind of boundary of the possible. I would find it very difficult to believe in it. I, I'd like to keep an open mind and, uh, and, and things, and uh, 
but this is a story that would be particularly difficult to, um, to believe in simply because as a mammal ecologist who goes out looking for tracks and signs of, of mammals, it's the, the way that we actually work on the animals because they tend to be reclusive and stay away from humans. Um, I think we would have found signs of it. Um, if people are, have seen it, then you would expect it would be much easier to find the signs that they leave behind. A prisoner of the tides, Ronan Coglin is preparing to spend the night on Omi Island. He hasn't given up hope of encountering the Dovar coup. With Sean Corcoran, who had a sighting of the otter, his wife said she was sure it had flippers rather than paws on the back. But as the sighting was at night, this could have been due to misperception. It seems to be a very large and very dangerous kind of otter. Don't go out sort of dangling fish over the water in the hope that the Bouverku will bite it, because it will probably take your arm off as well. Despite their terrifying encounter with the Dovarku, the Corcorans remain attached to Omi Island. For them, this remote land will always be magical. The grass is very short, there's rabbits everywhere, there's beautiful granite and limestone boulders everywhere, and like the beautiful, the landscape change, oh, and the sky, the sky in Omi, like when you look at the landscape and then you see the sky and the way the clouds come across it or a rainstorm comes, it's absolutely beautiful. For his part, Ronan Coglin dared to spend the night on Omi Island, lulled by the sounds of the mysterious island. I've played this sound to biologists and um, animal call experts, particularly um, marine animal experts, and none of them have been able to identify what it is, so I'm completely perplexed. The only thing that I can imagine is that I caught the call of the, the Dove Arhu. And did the cryptozoologist have his hoped for encounter with the Dove Arhu? Well, I'm afraid we were unlucky this time. The water was unbroken all night. No head of the Dovarku raised itself above. But there's always another day. One can always return. And in the meantime, the waters of the lake glide silently and slowly, covering whatever secrets lie beneath them. Yeah, we told quite a few people. Most people, as I said, thought we were kind of just pulling their leg. Um, it's taken people till now, actually, to realize that um, we weren't. Most people just thought, all right, yeah, Sean and Miranda, yeah. <laughs> I suppose I spent um, seven or eight years drawing the map. Every time we went back, I'd draw another little bit, put it away again, and, you know, that next year we might travel down again, I'd draw another little bit of the map and try and fit the pieces of the puzzle together. I don't believe in spaceships from outer space, so, like, I mean, I'm not... I have never witnessed anything like this before. I don't, I don't have a bookcase full of cryptozoology books. I'm, you know, I, I'm an artist. This is something that uh, my wife and I witnessed. Um, so I don't, I don't really, I, I, if it's a freak of nature, some kind of a giant species of otter, uh, or whatever it might be, I leave that to the experts, but I know what we saw and, you know, it's, uh, it'll stick with us forever, I'm sure. I'm not really concerned about what it is, to be honest, like, um, whether it's the Dover Coup or whether it's, I mean, I just know what I saw, and what I saw was this big giant creature thing right up in my face, and, uh, so, the story, that's the story, that's what I saw, that's, you know, that's, you know, I've never seen it again since 2003, so um, I may never see it again, maybe I will see it again, I don't know, maybe you'll see it, I don't know. For me, it's, you know, it's an intrigue for me, but I'm not tr out there trying to solve it. I do believe you saw. Yeah. You saw what you yeah. saw. Yeah. Just what that was, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's what yeah. the mystery is, what was it? Yeah. You know, yes. so that's... That's the mystery, yeah. And now I need a drink fairly badly. 
After his night on Omi Island, Ronan Coglin prepares for another encounter. But it's not a monster that awaits him, it's science. I've always felt that scientists who are in the mainstream of science have looked on cryptozoology askance, as it were. It's not the kind of thing, obviously, that you can say is part of mainstream science because it doesn't involve bringing things into a laboratory, putting them on a table and analyzing them. Well, science isn't really about going into a laboratory. Science, because, I mean, my science is all based in the field, but mm -hmm. science is based purely on evidence. So everything that we record is based on, on, on what we see and what's there to be seen. And although there are aspects of the cryptozoology that would be um, perfectly acceptable because you're taking in records and, and um, examining them and so on, it's perhaps the idea that you're um, reading too much into it without actually having the evidence to back it. Is the Duvahu a physiological impossibility? All the descriptions of it point, apart from the size and the orange feet, point to it being a, um, an otter. The thing is, though, it's um, seven foot, eight foot? In, in yes, some go as far as nine foot, but I mean, people who see things, particularly if they see things in the dark or in bad light, uh, can um, make a mistake with uh, the estimate of That's length. exactly it, but the otter is um, four to five foot max. Four foot would be the average size of a male otter, and males are much bigger than females. and. Where, you, like all, um, like ourselves, you could have a very, very tall person. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have a person that's twice the size of another person, no. and, and that's what this this Dover crew would be twice the size. Which makes is there any possibility of some kind of mutation? When a new species arises, very often it, it derives from a mutation that survives and, and goes on to breed. But the fact that there are records of these animals going back historically means that there's not just one of them, there are, a, there breeding are a breeding group of them, which means it makes it even harder to believe that they've never been, uh, that they're... they're Mind you, the ordinary otter is notoriously shy. I mean, I used to teach in a school which had an otter in a pond, and I never saw it once. For his part, Sean Corcoran hasn't taken a side in the debate between believers and skeptics. But one thing is certain, Whatever he saw that summer night in 2003 remains in the domain of the unexplained. Where there is some freak of nature that is a giant otter or a dove or coo of some kind that actually exists and is so shy that it only sometimes encounters humans, um, that's the closest thing that's ever been explained to me about what it could possibly be. The mystery continues. Like any good scientist, Dr. Colin Lawton likes to arm himself with evidence to support his claims. Oh, that's a magnificent one, isn't it? Yes. But I mean, an otter even of that size, you could, if you actually ran into one by accident, exaggerate its size considerably. Well, I think that's very likely what we're looking at here. I mean, this is the male otter, which is much bigger than the female. Um, this comes from our museum in the university. The description of the door coup is exactly what we're looking at here, except for the size and the feet. I think one can make easy mistakes about the color of the feet of an animal, because the feet of an animal, like an otter, will often be seen underwater, or at least not very clearly. So otters are nocturnal animals, so you, uh, it's most likely that they've been seen at yes. night, and so... Um, I mean, that looks just like descriptions of the Duvaku, yeah. and people who started talking of the Duvaku obviously thought they were talking about an otter, because that seems to be the original meaning of the word. You get a similar word for an an ordinary otter in both Welsh and Breton, so uh, I think that um, uh, might be to some extent the answer, but I still think the occasional mutant could have arisen. It seems that this is, whatever it is, it's a creature that is living on the island and, and is going about the waters there, and as I say, it's something that we, we really don't know what it is. I, I think it's most likely to be a big otter that's, that's caught someone by surprise. Yes. That's my, my view. But if I were to see that in the water, I wouldn't think it was a doofa who, but I would be pretty impressed with its size. I'll keep to it might exist, but there might be several different explanations for its existence. 
Jackie Corcoran, the sister of Sean, remains skeptical, but she admits that her brother is not the type to sink into storytelling. In short, the mystery remains unsolved. He would always have had his stories to tell, but I don't think he'd be a person who would be prone to exaggeration. He'd have a serious enough side to him, and he wouldn't be one to be uh, prone to practical jokes and that sort of thing. That wouldn't really be his, his style. I'm not a storyteller. I don't make up stories. I'm, uh, you know, I might tell a few yarns every now and again, but I'm not like, you know, I don't invent stories. So I suppose most people I've told seem to seem to believe me, whether maybe they go off and they'd say, hey, he's a bit, he's a bit cracked, maybe, I don't know. I looked up a dictionary of old Irish, that is to say Irish as spoken in early medieval times, and while it lists Dúvarhu as meaning otter, it doesn't have the monstrous uh, Dúvarhu mentioned in it. That doesn't mean that nobody knew anything about it, but they weren't saying much if they did. The Corcorans return every summer to Omi Island, but now they're far more careful. We've gone more upmarket. We rent a house each time we go to the island now. Yeah, and we lock the door. We had a, there was a knock at the door, and we, we kind of thought, oh, that's strange, the tide has just closed. But it was a, a man with his two dogs, and he said, how do I get off the island? Well, you don't right now. You, you better come in for some tea, <laughs> because the tide had closed behind him. So, I mean, that whole kind of element of freedom and kind of like, a, you know, you have, you know, that's, I hope that never changes. And I think that's what people, when they come to Omi, they go away with lovely memories of all of that. And over, I suppose over the years as well, we see generation after generation coming back, you know, bringing their children and then their children's children. Like maybe in a hundred years time, there'll be a preservation order on the island where you need to buy a ticket to go onto the island. I hope that doesn't happen because the freedom of the island is just, it's just so simple and unspoiled. Yes, we did get lucky. We did see something that could be a mystical creature, but it isn't a mystical creature, it's real. He's real, the Omi creature is definitely real. Um, yeah, the luck of the Irish, apparently we do have a few strange phenomenons in our country. So we, we were lucky enough to see one, maybe. I hope someday that somebody will um, come up with something constructive as a result of it all and that we'll cease the memory of, 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 um, of wonder. Mm. Strange things in Ireland.